isn't it a bit presumptuous to make such a top 10 when I've been reading fantasy for only one year now? Yes, it is. That doesn't mean I cannot do it. Hello everyone and welcome to Dutch Greybeard. I'm back in my usual recording studio, which is a very big word for what is actually my normal working space. I'm back here because setting up my studio with the other background you can see in my previous two videos is a lot of work. And also technically I ran into some difficulties that I'd rather not have to overcome every time I make a video for this channel. So we're back. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a degradation. With the background out of the way, I want to share with you my very first top 10 fantasy series. It is true that I should have read much more fantasy than I have to justify such a list. However, in my defense, I have read fantasy in my earlier years, and if I throw those in the mix as well, that gives me a stack of about 75 books which sounds like a nice quotum for a top 10, don't you think? Some of the series I read in the past have largely vanished from my memory. I couldn't retell the story of most of them, although I do recall my overall enjoyment. I should reread them, but that's not something I do very often. There is so much new fantasy to discover that I'd rather spend my reading time on that. No doubt, this list will radically change over the next couple of years. A few observations before I dive in. It's common practice on Booktube to name an author only once in these kind of lists, which I understand. On the other hand, if one author simply has written more than one amazing series, why not give him or her credit where credit's due? So I'll allow myself some leeway here. The other rule is that a series has to be read in its entirety or must have been completed by the author. Solid rules, of course. However, for now, I allow myself two exceptions. I haven't yet finished reading The Wheel of Time. I'm 12 books in and will most probably have read the final three around spring this year. Even though it isn't finished, I have a pretty good idea what I think about this series. The second exception is The Book of Dust, a trilogy by Philip Pullman, which hopefully will be finalized this year. This bending of the rules is something of an emergency measure, I have to admit, because now I have 18 series to choose from. It's not a whole lot, but it'll have to do. I'll quickly show you all of the series that participate in this competition in the chronological order in which I read them. The first one in the mix is The Duncton Chronicles by William Horwood. Second, The Becklin Empire, Richard Adams. Three, The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien. Four, Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin. Five, Amber by Roger Selazny. Six, The Book of Silence, William Horwood. Seven, The Wolves of Time also by William Horwood. 8. The Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis. 9. Hidden World, again, William Horwood. 10. His Dark Materials, Philip Pullman. 11. The Book of Dust, also by Philip Pullman. 12. The Ryeria Revelations, by Michael J. Sullivan. 13. The Wheel of Time, Robert Jordan. 14. The Belgariat by David Eddings. 15. The Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. 16. The Rift War Saga by Raymond T. Feist. 17. Mistborn Era 1 by Brandon Sanderson. And the final series is The Broken Earth by N.K. Jemison. All right, let's kick it off with number 10. This is The Book of Dust which is a series that's going to be a trilogy by Philip Pullman. And the final installment of the series is as of yet untitled. And hopefully that one will be published this year. It is very strange that you don't hear a lot about these books on this writer on Booktube. 
I read these books back to back at the end of 2019. This is YA at its best. Set in the same world as His Dark Materials, we follow Lyra Silvertongue, who in His Dark Materials is still called Lyra Belacqua. So we follow Lyra and her demon, Pentalimon, or Pan, through several stages of her life. The first book, Le Belle Sauvage, is 570 pages and was published in 2017. This adventure tells how Lyra, as a baby, survived several attacks on her young life because it was already known at that point in time that she was going to play a pivoting role in the future of her world, a role some people wanted to extinguish at an early stage. The second book, The Secret Commonwealth, is 687 pages and was published in 2019. The story takes place roughly 10 years after the end of His Dark Materials. Lyra is a young woman, and during a complex and vexing quest, her relationship with Pan, her demon, develops in a very unconventional way, to say the least. Both books are page-turners and are highly entertaining. They are action-packed, and at the same time, they provide food for thought. I highly recommend this series to people who do not shy away from YA, love a solid adventure in an intriguing world, and people who like to ponder on what's happening in between the lines. Coming in at number nine is The Rift War Saga by Raymond E. Feist. I read this series as a four book version in May and June of 2023. Magician is separated into two books, Magician Apprentice and Magician Master. Both were originally published as one book in 1982. Magician Apprentice is 485 pages and Magician Master is 499 pages. This is a great coming-of-age story and deeply immersed in the classical fantasy trope of the Chosen One, who first has to learn to master his abilities. An alien vessel, shipwrecked on the shores of Crydee, introduces the first sign of what is to become the Rift War. Through a mysterious rift, people from another world invade Mitkemia, the world where our main character Pug lives. This war will drag on for many, many years. The absolute highlight of this book for me was the part where Thomas, the childhood friend of our main character Pug meets Ruark, a golden dragon. Ruark is dying of old age and requests Thomas, who is there with Dolgan, the dwarf, to hold his death watch. This touching scene has everything I look for in fantasy. Beauty, reverence, wisdom, purpose, and so on. What I appreciated most in this series is Feist's writing skills. I'm a sucker for beautiful prose. Also, the writer maintains a very good balance between story development, action, character development, mystery, world building, and so on. I enjoyed the traveling between the two different worlds that are accessible only through the rift that gives this series its title. Less appealing to me were the seemingly endless battle sequences as well as the extensive pages on politics. Most of the characters involved here remained side characters to me at best. That is mainly why this book goes out like a candle at the end. That is, of course, Magician Master. The third book, Silverthorn, with 343 pages, was published in 1986. This was the least in the series for me. To me, the first half is slow pacing and redundant. The story of this quest for the extremely rare plant Silverthorn feels very much like an unnecessary sidestep from the main story of this rift war. One of the good things of this book is the appearance of Jimmy the Hand, who is a very entertaining character. Also, the writing remains high level. In the second half, the pacing picked up a little and the connection with the overall story was stronger. 
The ending is nothing less than magical and remains one of the most fantastical sequences I think back on a lot. That also goes for the final installment, A Darkness at Sethanon. This book has 430 pages and was published in 1986. It has everything that makes fantasy my go-to genre. There is so much profound storytelling here with ethereal beings and the surrealistic and bombastic finale that encompasses the entire universe and time. It has just a little bit too much war description, although one of the battles I still remember very vividly. All in all, I would certainly recommend this series, even though it contains some slug and less interesting parts, for me at least. But the highs trump the lows in the end. At number eight is a series that I literally have not seen or heard spoken of on Booktube at all, which is a crying shame. These four books were published between 2010 and 2013, and I read them all the moment they came out. Spring, with 505 pages. Awakening, with 408 pages. Harvest, 441 pages. And the closing volume is Winter, with 437 pages. After this series, nothing by this great author has been published. It is rumoured that he's working on a new book. Just a brief word on the story. Humans have lost their belief in ancient law that speaks of a jewel that holds four gems, each representing an essential part of our creation. Little people that exist on the borders of our world, the hidden, they still believe that the four lost gems can still be found to complete once again the jewel as a whole. This is of the utmost importance to save both worlds from destruction. Only Arthur Fall, a human professor in seismology, believes that the myths and legends have a root in reality. He knows the hidden world truly exists. After he has discovered a way to travel between the two worlds, he mysteriously disappears. One of the hidden the giant-born Jack, is sent to live among humans. There he rescues the girl Catherine from a burning car after an accident. A meeting that will change everything. Both Jack and Catherine search to find Arthur and travel between worlds, finding their destiny and love. It is a magical and adventurous story that spans generations and brings the reader to unknown realms, both physically as well as mentally. The narration, which is filled with mystery, a sense of destiny and purpose, is strongly character-driven. Highly, highly recommend these books, or any other for that matter, by this author. Hidden World Coming in at number seven is Mistborn, Era One by Brandon Sanderson. This is my first series by Brandon Sanderson and it was an absolute fun read for me. This trilogy was published between 2006 and 2008 and I read them in the summer of last year. I made a video on my reading experience. These three books made me an instant fan of Brandon Sanderson. It's not just a captivating story, but he invites readers to look beyond that. The third book, Hero of Ages, particularly gives food for thought on subjects as religion, hope and trust. Book one, The Final Empire, has 643 pages in this edition. Book two, the Well of Ascension is 763 pages long. And the final book, The Hero of Ages, has 724 pages. For me, each book surpasses the previous one. There is no need for me to retell the story here. All books kept me on the edge of my seat, but The Hero of Ages really gave me the kind of finale I love in fantasy. Sanderson is not a very poetic writer, he is more a storyteller at heart. But with a story like this, 
Who Needs Poetry? These are page turners that engage, bring fun and make a reader wonder at times about the deeper stuff. At number six, I have The Broken Earth Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. When I started reading this series, I wasn't sure if I would belong to the haters or the lovers. It didn't take very much more than a few chapters to realize that these books are absolutely written for me. It makes very much sense to me that all three books in this series are winner of the Hugo Award. The books were published from 2015 till 2017. In my edition, the page counts are 468 for the fifth season, 410 for the Obelisk Gate, and 416 for the Stone Sky. I read them in September and October of 2023. These books represent the literary form of fantasy. The writing style requires one's full attention, stamina and perseverance. The story is set in this world where natural cataclysms, so-called fifth seasons, occur every so many hundred years. The main character, Asun, mother of two children, sets out on a journey that will eventually turn out to be a quest not just for survival, but to rid her world of these seasons once and forever. The prose throughout the three books is phenomenal. Miss Jemison's writing is artful, well cared for, and it enchants me. The world is intricately built, as is its history. The characters are realistic, and the way they develop throughout the story is superbly done. The story itself is rather slow-paced, with the occasional exception, when all of a sudden, in one chapter, things take place at a breakneck speed. Another thing that required perseverance to keep on reading is the fact that the writer does not necessarily make it easy for her readers to understand what's happening. And then the story itself. It's very bleak and dark for the most part. Nevertheless, despite these barriers, I still think a lot about these books and I'm very glad to have read them. In the spoiler section of my video on this trilogy, I go into further detail about what I think is the reason behind the unusual second person narrative that so many booktubers are talking about. I'm not sure if I would recommend these books to anyone, but to me, they were the creme de la creme. We've arrived at my top five with, on number five, The Ryeria Revelations by Michael J. Sullivan. These books I read in February and March of 2023, when my only reference at that point were the books in The Wheel of Time. When I was five books into this huge series, I took a break in which I read this trilogy. The books were originally self-published as six books between 2007 and 2011. In my edition of three volumes, the first, Theft of Swords, has 681 pages. Rise of Empire is 786 pages long. And the closing installment, Heir of Nofron, has 932 pages. No small books. It's almost a year now since I read them, and in my memory they keep on getting better. This is a funny observation. When I was reading The Wheel of Time, I heard of this series on Booktube, and I understood that it was very good, but merely fun, and nothing very profound or exceptionally well written. With this horizon of expectancy, I read these books, and felt that my reading experience met with these opinions. But every time I read another series later on, I realized that these Ryeria revelations were not at all as shallow or casually written as I had assumed. In categories as writing skills, meaning or intricacy, they stand above several other series. I just hadn't read any at the time I read Ryeria. So thinking back on this series, as I regularly do, I am in awe of Sullivan's skills as a writer and storyteller just as I am now experiencing with Robin Hobb. I just finished reading the Farseer trilogy. 
Sullivan holds that special ability to come more than full circle in the final words. The closing pages of Air of Nofron will always be in my mind as the perfect example of how to finish a trilogy. And yes, this is a series I can easily recommend to anyone. Then at number four, a series that hardly anyone on Booktube ever talks about, to my astonishment. I am talking about His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman, his second series in this top 10. The books were published in between 1995 and 2000. The first book, Northern Lights, has 399 pages. The Subtle Knife is shorter with 341 pages. And the final book, The Ember Spyglass, is the thickest with 550 pages. I read this trilogy back to back in February and March of 2011. It confounds me that not more booktubers make mention of these amazing books. Perhaps this is because they are regarded as YA, which they may or may not be, but that sticker seems so irrelevant to me. YA, adult, it is what you see in the book itself that defines its measure. It is such an amazing story, set in a universe where the barrier between adjacent worlds with completely other laws is literally razor thin. What instantly drew me into the story from the very first sentence was the existence of demons. I mentioned them earlier when I was talking about the Book of Dust. Every human in the world where our main character Lyra Balakwa lives has his or her counterpart in an animal form of the other sex. Lyra's demon is called Pan, short for Pantalamayan. Demons of children can change form up to a certain age. At a certain time, their demon settles into their permanent animal form. Just this alone is so intriguing and so filled with possibilities and meaning. In other worlds, like the one of Will Parry, the character who Lyra meets in the second book, people have no demons. The two worlds meet, almost in the same way as the hidden world from William Horwood series meets the human world. Only here, the number of different worlds is infinite. It is impossible to do justice to the depth and sublimity of this trilogy. The movie with Daniel Craig and Nicole Kidman, The Golden Compass from 2007, gives one a good feeling of what this story is actually about. The follow-up of this movie was never made, unfortunately. I liked the Lyra from the movie a little bit better than the Lyra who performed in the HBO series. But at least this adaption from HBO is finished and it is not bad at all. For anyone who is not afraid to immerse him or herself into a surrealistic world with some thought-provoking themes like religion and death, I can definitely recommend this series. I cannot imagine this series to drop out of my top 10 anytime soon. We've arrived at the top three of my favorite fantasy series and coming in at number three is The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. I haven't talked about this foundational fantasy book before on this channel, but yes, this is one of my all-time favorites in the genre. To me, it is one book as Tolkien himself intended it to be. The Lord of the Rings was published in 1954 and 55. I first read this book as three separate volumes in a Dutch translation back in 1982. And I was absolutely blown away by them. I believe I read them three times before I began to read English. I then bought them in this one volume binding, which I must have read two times at least, probably three. I can't remember exactly. This binding, with appendices and an index, counts 1192 pages. What can I say about The Lord of the Rings that has not already been said? Perhaps the only thing to say is that it deserves a reread, because the movies have sort of taken over in my mind. I can quote all three of them verbatim, because me and my ex-wife used to watch them every winter. 
Now that I've discovered Audible.com, I plan on listening to the much-praised Andy Serkis narration of this important book. This may sound strange, but I am relieved to be able to say that this is an important book. Why do I say that? When I was studying Dutch and English, I became friends with one of my Dutch professors who persuaded me to fully turn my attention to literature. He had nothing positive to say about this book. Anything that so much as reeked after escapism was beneath him. And gullible as I was at that age, I instantly agreed with him, despite the fact that I had enjoyed reading this book so very much, which of course I didn't say to him. We fell out of contact before he passed away back in 2008, but even long before that, I understood that the enjoyment in reading for me was not about how highly a book was praised by literary critics, but simply how much a book appealed to me personally, without any scientific proof of its quality. And this book, I enjoyed very, very much. Coming in at number two, The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. The number one series, which I'll get to in a minute, marks my birth as a reader for life. The Wheel of Time marks the rebirth of my journey into fantasy. That is why this series will always hold a special place in my heart. I know that already, even now, when I haven't even finished reading it. I have the three final books on my TBR for these final winter months. I won't name all the titles, their publication dates and their page count. They're here right behind me. Instead, I've made an easy overview for those of you who are interested in these kind of statistics. In my video, The Wheel of Time, 12 books within 10 months, I spent more than half an hour telling about my love for this series, including a few of the low points. I'm one of those readers who experienced a slog with The Path of Daggers, Book 8, and Book 10, Crossroads of Twilight. They were my least favourite, but with 7 out of 12 scoring higher than 90 points, that is really saying enough. In this chart, I added the scores I gave each book. The average of these scores is 89.5, which compares to 4.5 stars. I love these books and cannot wait to finish reading the series. It may just happen that the final three books lift this series to the number one spot the next time I'll be making this list. Then we finally arrived at the number one in my top 10 favorite series. That is by an author who is also twice represented on this list, namely William Horwood. The Duncton Chronicles are the best series I can possibly think of in this genre. I'll show you the book that turned me into a reader. This is the Dutch translation of the first book in the trilogy. William Horwood is one of my most beloved authors of all time. His books were very important in my development as a reader and as a writer. Before I started reading books for adults, I read and continuously reread my one shelf of children's books. Then I stumbled upon this translation of Duncton Wood. This is the first book, as I mentioned, in the Duncton Chronicles, and I found myself up all night, several nights in a row, because I simply could not stop reading. It changed my perspective on reading for good. The first book in this trilogy, Duncton Wood, was published in 1980, and it has 628 pages in this paperback edition. This is the American version with the most hideous cover one can imagine. I have another edition of Duncton Wood, the first book, and this one is signed by the author. Okay, after this first book in the series, Horwood published three non-fantasy novels before returning to his Duncton Chronicles. Duncton Quest, number two in the series, was published in 1988. Because I couldn't wait for the paperback edition, which is normally the format I like to read best, I bought it the day of its publication in 1988. This one has 717 pages. The third volume, Duncton Found, has 978 pages. In case you hadn't noticed yet, I love, love, love these books. 
They hold a very special place in my heart, and I wish people would still be reading them nowadays. The Duncton Chronicles have been popular some time, but they're faded away into memory like so many books and authors have. They belong to the same subgenre as Watership Down by Richard Adams. I recently reread the first book on audio and found that it still touched me somewhere deep inside and managed to bring me to tears several times. Let me tell you very briefly about the story. The series is about the tribulations moles who live in seven different systems in the south of England go through. They encounter war, they encounter savagery, repression, dictatorship, but they also experience love, understanding and a word which is very important in Horwood's books, acceptance. Horwood's gift is to transport the reader to the world of these humble creatures and bring it alive. Filled with lore, prophecies and destination, the main characters find their way, guided more by feeling than by understanding. It is an outrage that these books are no longer in print anymore. If I could, I would lift the veil of oblivion that now hangs over this series and its author. But I am merely a small booktuber with love for good books. And this series is the best fantasy series I can possibly think of. If you can get your hands on a copy of them, I'd urge you to buy them instantly and read them. They deserve it, as do you. So, this is my top 10 fantasy series. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this list. Do you agree or completely disagree with this ranking? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you very much for watching this video. Until we meet again at Dutch Greybeard. Mm -hmm.